If you ever wondered about the forces involved in machining, try parting off 3 quarter inch tool steel in a small lathe. When that blade snagged, look at how the tool post twists under the force. And of course the blade is actually twisting in there as well. It's really quite amazing. Here you can see with a blade dug in on the side of the material near the bottom of that cut. Anyway, that's not what this video is about, so I'm going to go change my shorts and I'll be right back. Hello Internet, my name is Quinn and this is Blondie Hacks. Here in the hobby metal shop, nothing will make you feel like a wizard quite like heat treating steel. This is an amazing process that people love to make more complicated than it needs to be. I'm going to show you how simple it can be. All you need is a torch and you can make all your own tools. I'm going to show you how right now. Step one in heat treating is to choose your steel. It has to be a heat treatable steel, which means a high carbon steel. Typically this means tool steels, although there's some other steels like 4140 that can be heat treated, but typically we're going to be talking about tool steel. The most common types of tool steel you're going to encounter are O1, as shown here most commonly in the form of drill rod, as we call it in North America. The Brits would call this silver steel. You might also encounter D2 in plate form. This is really commonly used by knife makers. Another common form is W1, and you might also see A2. It's very important to know what kind you have because that letter tells you how to quench the steel in order to harden it. That's also why it's very important to label your steel because short of a gas chromatograph, there's absolutely no way to tell tool steels apart. And if you don't know which one you have, you're not going to know how to heat treat it properly. Heat treating is all about modifying hardness. So for this demonstration, I'm going to be using this, my PTC Instruments hardness tester. I'm showing you this for educational purposes only. This is not a cheap tool. I was lucky enough to be gifted this. Hardness testers in general are not inexpensive. They are an exotic tool, probably out of the reach of most home gamers, and you absolutely do not need one to do what we're doing today. If you do want to have some kind of hardness testing system, the most budget-friendly option are the hardness testing file sets, like this one shown here. I'll link to this below. But you don't even really need that for what we're doing today. Here's a regular old file. When you buy tool steel, unless otherwise specified, it's going to come in the soft or annealed form. And as you can see, the file can dig into it and it can cut it. You can see it's removing material, and you can absolutely feel it when you push that file into it, that it's removing material. The file teeth are cutting. That's how you know it's soft. In this softened state, it can also be machined, as I'm about to demonstrate. This is a very useful thing to know because, for example, if you had old tooling that you want to modify or reuse, you can anneal it, which is to say re-soften it, and then machine it and harden it again. I'm making a couple of discs here to demonstrate all the steps in the process. If you're going to machine your tool steel, make sure to get as good a finish as you can. The better the finish is on the steel, the easier it is to see the steps in the tempering process. And pro tip, tool steel, even in its soft form, is a really great steel to use for all kinds of things. You don't have to harden it. It's an extremely tough steel. And toughness is actually a technical term when we're talking about steel. It refers to the ability of a material to resist deformation without cracking. So if you need something to be really strong and or tough, consider tool steel even without the hardening. Now, parting tool steel because of that toughness is not for the faint of heart, especially on a small lathe. I would not recommend this unless you're comfortable parting, you've had a lot of experience doing it on your machine. Tool steel is extremely unforgiving when parting. The speeds and feeds have to be just right. There's a very narrow window for all of those variables compared to other materials, and the punishment for failure on it is quite high because it's so tough. That blade will dig in and, well, bad things will happen. I'm demonstrating that it can be done, but honestly, I tend not to part off tool steel unless the order of operations really demands it. It's usually not worth the anxiety. Let's take a look at the hardness of these before we do anything to them. The way this tool works is it has a calibrated center punch, which punches a mark of a known size, and then the microscope has a graduated scale inside, and the larger the punch mark, the softer the material is. You put the scope centered over your punch mark, you line up the bottom of the punch mark with that bottom reference line, and then the lines at the top tell you the Rockwell C hardness of the material based on the size of that punch mark. As you can see, we're about 35 here. I know that things may not look like they're lined up, but there is parallax on this scope when I try to point a camera down there, so you'll have to kind of take my word for some of these measurements. 
It's much easier to see in person. All right, time for heat. Let's talk torches. I'm going to be using this guy. This is a standard hardware store yellow torch. Now, people call these map gas. They're not actually map gas. Real map gas hasn't been manufactured, at least in North America, since 2008. What they have nowadays is called Map Pro. Now, Map Pro is actually just propane. It burns at the same temperature, give or take, as propane, but they've added propylene to it, which makes the gases transfer their heat into the material quicker but it does not actually burn hotter. If you didn't know map gas doesn't actually exist anymore, don't feel bad. I didn't either until just a couple of years ago because they quietly changed it and they kept the yellow bottles just to confuse us all. But you can do this with regular propane as well. You don't have to buy the more expensive yellow bottles and you certainly don't need acetylene or oxypropane or anything fancy for this. Regular old propane burns at 3,500 degrees and that's plenty for this. The other thing you will need is quenching medium. I'm using O1 tool steel. And the O stands for oil hardening. If you're using D2, D2 is an air hardened or can also be an oil hardened steel. W is water hardened and A is air hardened. You can use any kind of oil for this, doesn't matter. I'm using canola oil because it smells like french fries. I used to use used motor oil, which also works just fine and makes the shop smell like the sweet, sweet embrace of death. And away we go. I'm going to do this in the dark because torch hardening and tempering is all about color. And it's easier for you to see the color on camera if it's dark. For the hardening process, all we're trying to do is get it up to a glowing, what people call cherry red or kind of an orangish red. Anything in the bright red to orange color spectrum is going to be fine. And when you see that bright orange color, you want to hold it there for a good several seconds. Just keep feathering that torch to kind of hold it at that orange color. It is possible to overheat it doing this with certain types of tool steels, so don't go bananas, but just make sure to hold it at that orange temperature for a while to make sure that the heat has soaked all the way through. And then it's time to quench. Grab it quickly with some pliers that you don't care too much about and dunk it in your quenching medium. Good quenching technique is also important. You want to move it around, and that's because bubbles will stick to the surface, and those bubbles will keep the quenching medium from touching the surface, interfering with the quench. So keep it moving. For quenching long, skinny things, holding them vertically and moving them up and down can help reduce the warping that can occur in the tool steel when you quench it. Once you've quenched it long enough for it to be cooled down, it's going to come out all black and messy. Don't worry about it. We're going to clean that off in a minute. It's not a big deal, so don't panic. The next step is going to require a clean, shiny surface. So we need to clean off all of the soot from the quenching. A little bit of 320 grit emery is all you need. That soot is not really stuck on there very good. doesn't take much effort at all to remove it. At this point, the steel has been hardened. It is very, very hard. Too hard for most use cases. But let's just take a look now and see what the hardness tester has to say. I can already feel on the punch how much harder it is. Here it is under the scope. It's so hard now that it almost doesn't register. It's right on that bottom line, 65 Rockwell C. So this is blazingly hard. This is about as hard as you can get steel in a hobby shop. Now, as I said, that's too hard for most use cases, and in fact, what we've done here is we've traded a lot of the toughness of the tool steel for hardness. This steel will now be very, very resistant to abrasion of any sort, but it's brittle, almost like glass. Let's do the file test once again, and you can see that file just skates right over it. In fact, you can feel it. It's like rubbing glass on glass. It scuffed the dirt on the surface, but it didn't cut into it at all. Another way to do this test is to rub it back and forth on the file, and if it feels the same sliding in both directions, then the file isn't cutting it. To sell you that point on brittleness, here's another piece of drill rod that I hardened to 65 Rockwell C. And boom, look at that. You can shatter it just by tapping it with a hammer. And look how clean that break is. So this steel is incredibly hard. Now for some applications, you can leave it this way. For example, a wear block in a sliding mechanism something where the part isn't going to be subjected to any kind of shearing or pulling or twisting forces, that brittleness might not be an issue. However, most of the time, you're going to need it to be a little bit tougher than that, so you're going to want to temper it. And what tempering does is it brings back some of that toughness that we lost by hardening it. To temper it, once again, all we need is our friend the torch, and a little bucket of water nearby will come in handy. There is a little bit of skill in this part of it, so this may take some practice, but what you need to do is heat the piece up slowly. You can see how I'm just kissing it with the torch a little bit at a time, and we're keeping an eye on the color of that surface. 
And this is why the piece has to be clean and shiny because you need to be able to see clearly the color of that part. Once you see a little bit of yellow start to form on that surface, grab it and dunk it in the water real fast. The goal is to get the piece to stop at a yellow or a yellowish brown color. That dunk in water is not technically a quench because the piece wasn't hot enough. All we're doing is we're stopping the heat so that the temper doesn't keep going. Heat has a little bit of an inertia to it and the temper will continue after you take the torch away. And it's very easy to over temper the part. Now it's kind of a yellowish brown color. It's leaning a little more towards brown than I would like, but this should still be perfectly fine as a temper. This yellow brown temper is what you're going to use for 90% of the things that you make in a hobby shop. Let's punch this now and see what the hardness tester has to say about it. Looks like we are somewhere between 55 and 60 Rockwell C now. So we've lost a little bit of our hardness, but now this part will not shatter if we hit it with a hammer. This part is going to be completely usable as a cutting tool, as a punch, all sorts of things. It's got almost all of its toughness back. Let's do that file test again. And you can see now, when I put that file on there, I can remove a little bit of material. The file is biting, but just barely. So this is now softer than a standard file, but just barely. I can feel it grabbing a little bit when I slide towards the cutting edges on the teeth, as opposed to sliding backwards where it's glassy smooth, but you wouldn't want to file that, honestly. It'd be pretty hard on your files. So this is still quite hard. Since torch tempering does require a little bit of skill and practice, I'll throw another option at you, and that is that you can do this in a toaster oven. This method is a little bit more idiot-proof, but it does take a lot longer, sometimes as much as a couple of hours. The torch tempering takes five seconds. But uh, the way this works is very similar. We're just using an oven instead of a torch. So you heat that part up until it's somewhere in the range of 375 to 400 for a yellow-brown temper. This piece is 500, which is a little hot. So I turn down the oven. Then you want to leave it in that oven at that temperature for probably 45 minutes to an hour. You have to make sure that that temperature is soaked all the way through the material, which with an oven takes quite a while. Better to leave it in there too long than not long enough. Just like with the torch, if you have a glass door on the oven, you can look in there and you can see the color. You've got the temperature of the oven correct when you see that yellow-brown color on it. You just want to then leave it in there long enough to make sure that that heat has soaked all the way through. Here's my oven-tempered part. It's a little more on the brown side than my torch tempered one because I, again, had the oven a little hot when I first started. But again, this would be a perfectly adequate temper, most likely. So keep that in your back pocket as well. If you don't like the torch tempering method or you're struggling to get it to work, you can always use a toaster oven. Regardless of your tempering method, if you keep going, apply more heat past that yellow brown color, then you get into these purples and blues. And this is a softer temper. This has many uses as well, so it's good to know what this looks like. Let's get the punch on this and let's see what it looks like. And here you can see we're somewhere in the 45 to 50 range now. So this is noticeably softer than the yellow brown, but this is going to be tougher and more flexible than the yellow brown part is. Here's a small punching tool that I heat treated recently, and I'm going to show you this because it's got all the colors on it. At the far right end, we've got the lightest yellow color. That's going to be the hardest. And then it transitions into the yellows and browns, getting a little softer. And then it goes into the purples and the blues, softer still. And then left of the blue there, softer still, but not fully annealed yet. With a long skinny tool like this, it's helpful to know another technique for tempering, which is how tools like this are typically tempered. And that is you apply the heat at one end only. And you can see I'm, again, just kissing the far end of it with the torch and watching that color develop. You can actually see the colors moving down the part as the heat travels down the part. So you can watch for that light yellow color to reach the business end of your tool and then stop and dunk it in the water at that point. Tempering this way is not just cool and convenient, there's a very good reason for doing it. Twist drills, for example, are typically tempered this way because you want the cutting edge to be as hard as possible, but you want the shank that goes in the Jacobs chuck to be softer. That's because you want it to be a little bit flexible so the drill won't shatter if it's wandering a little bit. And also you want the Jacobs chuck, which is very hard, to be able to grip the shank of that drill, so you need the drill shank to be softer. This is also true of things like screwdrivers and chisels, because you want, say, a very hard cutting edge or a very hard end effector on that tool, but that shank is going to be subjected to a lot of gorilla leaning and being hit with hammers and other forms of abuse, so you want the shank or the tang of that tool to be flexible. Now remember that piece of drill rod that I shattered because it was so hard? Let's complete the heat treating triangle now and demonstrate annealing. 
Annealing is how you make things soft again from any state where it's hard. And this is super easy. You heat it up to that same glowing reddish orange that you did when you hardened it, but just don't quench it. Let it cool down naturally in the air. And now, here's that hammer test again, and it bends. Look at that. Now it's soft again. You can machine it, do whatever you want, then reharden it again if you want to. And that is it. That is everything that the home hobbyist probably needs to know about heat treating. And the cool thing about this process is that it's all a circle. If you don't get the hardening quite right, or if you over temper it, you can always just anneal it, reharden it, and do it all again. You can do this in a circle as many times as you want. Or if you have a hardened tool that you want to modify, you can anneal it, machine it, harden it, and temper it again. That's what's so cool about this whole process. And as I said at the top of the show, there's way, way more that you can do here. If you're getting into knife making or other more sophisticated forms of heat treating, then you're going to need to know more details about this. And at that point, you might want to start looking at a heat treating oven or more expensive toys like that. But for 90% of the home hobby machinist kind of tool making stuff that you're going to want to do, this is all you need. Don't be intimidated by all the complexity that people like to add to this. And don't feel like you can't do this. You absolutely can. It's an incredibly powerful skill to have in your tool bag. I hope you'll give this a try. Thank you so much for watching. And thanks to my patrons for making all of this content possible. And I will see you next time.